So what do you get when you cross? A thief, an assassin, a thug, a walking tree, and a gun-toting, foul-mouthed space raccoon. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, the highest grossing movie of 2014. What do you get when you cross art and technology with psychology, anatomy, and $170 million? The visual effects for Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> now granted, $170 million wasn't the effects budget, it was the budget of the entire film. But it did take a small army of many, many visual effects artists, very talented visual effects artists at Framestore in London to bring Rocket Raccoon, one of the hero characters, to life on the big screen. Now visual effects attracts professionals from a really wide array of talents, technology and creativity. Um, it's not just animators that you may read about in the odd Wired article, but also lighters, producers, computer programmers, and riggers like me. But even with all of these talents under one roof, we often have to look outside of our own industry and use scientific research from seemingly unrelated fields to, as reference to enrich our work. I'll never forget my animator's face when I asked him to reproduce psychological research conducted in Papua New Guinea for a rocket raccoon. <laughs> so how do you build a space raccoon? Well, when I'm sitting at my desk at 11, 12 o'clock at night, I like to think that I've been tasked with saving the universe, just like Guardians of the Galaxy, but actually what we do as visual effects artists is we're tasked with helping to make the fantastical realistic and believable. Now we have wonderful painters who can help us to visualize the fantastical element of our work, like this beautiful concept painting of Rocket Raccoon, which was provided to us and was our starting point for Rocket. But for the believable element, we have to look to the real world. So. We're frequent users <laughs> of animal encounter services. We also love the Natural History Museum and its library. I had a library card from the Natural History Museum in my wallet for a few years, and I was so proud. I know how geeky that is, but it's true. <laughs> um, we also love the London Zoo. Um, the director, James Gunn, was very specific that we um, should not be using Rocket's body as reference here. He said he was way too fat. <laughs> I mean, that just goes to show like the sort of body psychology in Hollywood, right? <laughs> but, we, but we did use, <laughs> but we did use um, Oreo here as the primary fur pattern reference for Rocket's face. <laughs> what we did look to for Rocket's physicality of his body is one of our go-to resources which is veterinary science and osteology, who have a wealth of online resources that we use regularly for many a small carnivore, including raccoons. In fact, I have a plastic cast of that raccoon skull on my desk as we speak, and I'm keeping it for sentimental value only. <laughs> but I did put it to practical purpose. We scanned it, we put it into the computer, we do work in the computer in the 3D world, um, and we used it as volume reference for Rocket's head. So now we have the skull, we have the computer model, and uh, what we did with these things is we put these together and generated a realistically proportioned raccoon. We did this so that we could figure out just how much like a raccoon James Gunn meant when he said, just like a raccoon. <laughs> what he actually meant was a very small human with a raccoon head. <laughs> But this process is not exclusive to Rocket Raccoon. It's actually very standard in our industry. We do this all the time. Um, and also in Guardians of the Galaxy, the other hero character that we studied horticulture reference for was Groot, the walking tree. We looked at vines, root growth patterns. We also looked at how vines grow and how plants sprout and flowers bloom to help Groot grow loads of armor that would ultimately be shot off by hoverbots that were trying to kill him. 
Um, it was particularly, well, not particularly, but it was very challenging to make Groot a believable character considering that throughout the entire film, he only utters three simple words. I am Groot. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> So Groot didn't talk that much, but Rocket would not shut up. <laughs> so how do you make a raccoon talk? Well, as a rigger, I'm responsible for taking the 3D generated model and figuring out the physiology. So I put joints, I put muscles, and I put a bunch of controls so that the animators can move a control and the character smiles or blinks or raises his arm. Think about it like a marionette puppet. But there's a lot of different ways that I can approach this. I've been rigging faces for many, many years on many different kinds of animals. Um, and this is quite an inter industry standard, but it takes a long time to figure out exactly which controls you should actually be providing and which ones you shouldn't. You don't want to go off model. You want to have the least amount of controls with the maximum amount of control. Um, so where do you start? For me, I start in the mid-19th century. Here's Duchenne de Boulogne, the father of French neurology, conducting some of his muscle behavior research using, um, by shocking individual muscles uh, and to, to see what their exact behavior was. I like to think that the guy on the right is making this sound. <laughs> <laughs> now to Papua New Guinea, where my idol, Paul Ekman, there on the left, Paul Ekman is a psychologist who, at the time, was studying nonverbal communication. He went to Papua New Guinea to try to prove that expressions, as they relate to emotions, is universal, and it doesn't matter where you're from, what you've been exposed to, what your culture is. The way that he did this was he presented the four tribesmen with a series of stories and a series of photographs of different emotions and asked them to make a relationship. So he said to the tribesmen, show me the picture when a friend comes to visit your village. And he'd show them a picture of happy and sad. And the tribesmen pointed to the happy expression. And through a series of this, um, he proved that there were seven basic expressions that were universal across all cultures. Happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, disgust, and the look on my animator's face when I asked him to reproduce this on Rocket Raccoon. <laughs> Contempt. <laughs> so the next stage for Ekman was to create the facial action coding system, which again is sort of an industry, stra uh, industry standard um, in visual effects on how we construct facial animation. What he did was he identified many individual actions that a face can do as it relates to emotions and expressions, and also intensities therein. And by combining these different things, you can create the largest array of facial expressions and be emotionally, or emotionally expressive. So for me, as a rigger, this is perfect. So here's Rocket Raccoon doing his fax workouts with controllers for each action unit. Now this is just one piece of the puzzle. There are so many people that contribute to digital characters in 3D and we work on it for years. Lots of different skill sets. Um, and <laughs> it's not all human expressions too. There's the raccoons in there too. And this is the result of our work. Oh boo hoo hoo, my wife and child are dead. <gasps> Oh, I don't care if it's me. Everybody's got dead people. It's no excuse to get everybody else dead along the way. Come on, Groot. Ronan has the stone. And that's what you get when you mix hundreds of visual effects artists, a plaster cast raccoon skull, a tribe in Papua New Guinea, and a masochistic French neurologist. Thank you.